Gracious Heavenly Father, again we give thanks that we can gather together, we can come and be with you to meet one with the other, to partake of your word, to sing in song, and to partake of this Eucharist today. But indeed, let your Holy Spirit reign within us as we partake of your word and fulfill our spirit. Anahipto. Farakalo. Anahipto. In other words, please be seated. Yes, the title of this sermon is Please Be Seated. It came about as I was looking at the text as I was preparing. Actually, it was a few weeks ago. And I was struck by the words that say, Make the people sit down. So they sat down. And then he distributed them to those who were seated. I wondered what it meant and how important it was that the people sit down. That we sit down right now as I stand. You see, when the Jewish teachers would preach, when they would speak, when the crowds would gather around, the Jewish professors would sit and everybody else stood. So this is a particular and peculiar moment where they're asking them to sit down. But again, as we know, our English language has become lazy. To sit down. What does it mean to sit down and to be seated? It all depends on what you mean. But how can we explain what we mean if we use three simple letters, sit? Now, some of our animals understand that. Sit, be good, sit. Some are better than others. <laughs> but the meaning of sit in the Bible, there are at least 25 different words used for sit, which shows the importance of the meaning of sit. Is it katheo? To simply sit. Is it parakatheo? To sit amongst one another. Is it sanundro? To sit as the Sanhedrin would sit. Sanhedrin. The council. But in this particular case, it means to sit and to meet. Now I posted something on Facebook and I was wondering if I would hear any news about people saying, you've got a typo in there, Brian. You spelled meat. M-E-A-T. Don't you mean meat? M-E-E-T? I guess nobody read it or nobody cares, or maybe they get it. Maybe they understood because I put a little hint in there, Luke 11, verse 37. And what does it say in Luke 11, verse 37? What does it say in other parts of the scriptures that give us a better idea of what it means to sit in this particular case? Because the same Greek word is used. In Luke 11, verse 37, it says, And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in, and he sat down to meet, M-E-A-T. It's a wonderful occasion when somebody invites you over to their house to meet. Because you gather and you sit around the table, sometimes in the garden, sometimes around the pool, sometimes even in the kitchen. Aren't those the best meals? The ones where we all sit about and meet, M-E-A-T, in the kitchen. There's another term where in John 13, after Jesus was washing his feet, taking his garments, and was set down again to sit. He sat down again to do what? What did Jesus sit down to do after he showed the example of washing feet? He sat down to meet. He sat down to eat the Last Supper, the Passover meal. The expression to each and every one of us what we are called to do in having the Eucharist. It also goes on to speak of his particular disciples, the disciple whom he loved. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, lying on his chest, 
The same word is used in John 13. The same word is used in John 21. Paul, in which also leaned on his breast to sit, to partake in food together, but to sit closely one with the other, to join together in love and caring as the disciples did. It's also used in Luke 17, where it's this parallel of if your workers come in, do you tell them to go and sit down to meet? When your workers come in from the field, do you set a table for them for them to sit and eat? It's Luke 22, verse 14. The hour had come and Jesus sat down with the twelve. And he had the final meal, the Passover meal. The meal that would explain to us and show to us what it means to have Eucharist. In the back of your bulletin, just underneath the postal, and I invite you to read this during the postal. It's the institution of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. This is Paul speaking to each and every one of us. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he gave given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also. And after saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our text goes on to say that Jesus took the loaves of bread. Jesus is with the people and he's healing the people and he's ministering to the people, he's teaching the people, and then he feeds them with bread because their bellies are hungry. But the example is feeding them with more than bread because their bellies will be hungry again. But he wants to feed them with his word, his body, his being, his logos, his whole entity, his ego, so that they will live on forever. Then he took the loaves of bread which he had given thanks, and he distributed them to those who were seated, who had come together to lean on his chest, to put their whole life into his hands and into his body, into his being, to receive the bread of Jesus Christ, as we have done here today. We have come to be seated at Theos, but we've also come to be seated at Anito, to come and be seated and lean our head against the chest of Jesus Christ to accept them into our hearts as we receive the bread. And that bread is a physical bread, but it's a symbol of the knowledge and body of Jesus Christ, which we receive and maintain by reading his word. And just as we need to receive bread each day, we need to receive his word into our hearts, into our chest each day. It's an interesting story of the bread and the people who were hungry. Where Jesus tests his disciples. And is he not testing us with our own faith? And then Philip answers, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them. And so then Andrew says, but there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. Somebody, the young boy, brought us lunch. And probably his mother said, you take a lunch with you. You'll be hungry. And don't let the bad boys steal it from you. But they did. And they multiplied it. And then they distributed it. And again, is that not what we do when we take the Eucharist? We take this bread and this wine and we multiply it and we distribute it one with the other. And we take that out with us. But how did Jesus know how to do this? If we read the previous chapter, John 5, verse 19, it says, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing on his own, but only when he has seen the Father doing it. In verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous. righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me, my Father. 
We learn from our fathers. We learn from our mothers. And Jesus learned from his heavenly father to do these wonderful things. There's a passage where Jesus says to the disciples, what I have done, you will go and do even greater. What the Son has done is even greater than what the Father has done. And we have an example of what the Father has done in our Old Testament reading from 2 Kings. Now there was a bit of a switch. When I looked at these readings, I discovered the meaning of sit down and the importance of the bread and the multiplication, and especially this text of where did Jesus learn this? I did a search. Because perhaps I never learned this in seminary or I wasn't present physically or mentally. And all of a sudden I realized that Jesus learned this because he read it in 2 Kings. Because the same thing was done using Elisha, using that great prophet, where God showed him to multiply. And the same words are used where he's going to multiply the bread for the hundred men. And one of the servants says, how can I set this before a hundred men? It's the same thing. But what are they among so many people? But they said to Jesus. But he says, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and they shall have some left. That what we partake here, there needs to be something left that we can take home and we can share with our friends and with our family and those who are in great need. But I think it's important that we see it as more than just the bread. We also see it in the wine. We see the importance of this story also of the widow's oil and the faith aspect of this widow's oil and what oil symbolizes. It symbolized many things in that day. It symbolized wealth, abundance, health, energy. It's a vital ingredient for a good life. But it also represents a spiritual abundance. Delicia asks the lady who all of a sudden has become a widow. In other words, she has ended up with nothing. She has two children who she's going to lose to creditors. In other words, they will be dead to her. She's lost her husband. She's losing her children. She'll lose her house. She'll lose everything. And she's asked, what does she have? And she says, I have nothing. And then she remembers she has that one small jar of oil. She has that one small jar of faith. And Alicia says, send your people out to find empty vessels. Send your people out to find those empty vessels, the people of this world who are walking around empty because they do not have the oil of faith and provision and spirit and wealth and abundance. And they begin to pour the oil into that, those vessels, one after another after another, until there are no more vessels. And then the oil stops. And that oil is enough for her to get herself out of debt. It's enough for her to sustain herself for the rest of her life. And that is the wisdom of God that we can receive for each and every one of us. The wisdom of God that fulfills us in that trying time when we believe we've lost everything. The wisdom of God to know that He will indeed deliver us as we receive the oil of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, as we receive the bread. Do we realize how important this is in our life? Do we realize the magnitude and potential of this in our life? Or are they simply Stories from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, simply we read the Ephesians, where Paul again is speaking now to the Ephesians, and he says that, and he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit. Just as this widow was strengthened in her inner spirit through the power through the Spirit of the oil, can we not also? It says here, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? What is the breadth, the length, the height and the depth of your Holy Spirit? The oil that you have within your heart that is leaning on your chest today. Is it enough to go and share it with other people? 
And to truly understand this statement is to look up the meanings of the words breadth and length and height and depth. And not just the ones from our dictionary, but the biblical terms. Breadth, as if the arms are encircling the whole world. The length, that they go to the depth of the earth and to the height of the heavens. And again, the height is far beyond into the galaxies upon galaxies, which we're still discovering. And the depth is the profond. The depth, we can look into our pool and say, well, wow, that's mighty deep. But this depth, is continuous. And this is the knowledge and wisdom. The love of Jesus Christ as we lay our head upon his chest surpasses all knowledge. And so I invite you as you come and you take this Eucharist today, as you take the bread, as it is distributed to you, and as you receive the cup either by simply touching the chalice or receiving the cup, and perhaps you may want to take an extra one home your friends, to your family, to your parents, to share the wisdom and knowledge of Jesus Christ through the bread of his body, to lean upon the chest of those who could not be here today and who need to hear what's feeling. Because this world is in a difficult situation. Psalm 14 says it all in verse 1. Fools say in their hearts there is no God, no the deliverance of Israel can come to Zion. But verse 7 says, when the Lord restores the fortune of his people, Jacob will rejoice, Israel will be glad, and we will be glad. So receive the Eucharist today as the multiplying bread of Jesus Christ. Lean your head on his chest and receive his thanksgiving for you today. Amen.